Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I am happy to welcome you to today's scenario planning for a post-pandemic future. The COVID-19 pandemic is producing major upheaval. We don't yet know where all the chips are going to fall. We do know, however, that the world will be transformed and the Jewish community will confront many changes. That's why we recently embarked on a scenario design process that imagines how the United States and the world would look in the next two years. We can't predict, but we can imagine alternative futures that will affect the Jewish community in different ways, which we can then use to help prepare. In this webinar, we will be sharing information about the scenario planning process and providing a mini training in how to facilitate something similar within your own organization. And now I would like to introduce Andre Spaconi, President and CEO of the JFN, of JFN, to start us off today. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Tamar, and welcome, everybody. I hope everybody is safe and healthy. Um, just a couple of words about what we're trying to do today. Um, this is um, this is aimed to give you a flavor of a process that we conducted in terms of designing or uh, imagining the scenarios that our communities can confront uh, in the future. Uh, as a word of caution, I would say that these processes generally take a long time and we condense them um, into a series of sessions. And what we're giving you today is, as I said, just a flavor uh, with the goal that you can then use this technique uh, in your own organizations or you can use the scenarios that we design and think about what are the implications we have uh, they, they have for for you the session today will be um, will have several parts uh, at the beginning we're going to explain a little bit what the scenarios are and what are not is important to to know uh, to be precise about what scenarios do and what they don't uh, then we're going to tell you a little bit about the process that we did um, at JFN to come up with the scenarios that we produced. And finally, we're going to do a kind of an exercise of how you can use the scenarios in your organization, in your foundation. And we have a few volunteers that are going to help us uh, do an example of, of that process. But um, to start, uh, understanding the process that we did and the scenarios. I'm going to ask uh, Scott to show us a video that talks about the scenarios and the process. It's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Maybe now more than ever. The pandemic is producing major upheaval, and we don't yet know where all the chips are going to fall. We do know, however, that the world will be transformed, and our community will confront momentous changes. That's why, at Jewish Funders Network, we've embarked in a scenarios design process that imagines how the country and the world will look in the next two years. We can't predict, but we can imagine alternative futures that will affect the Jewish community in different ways. We don't ask if the scenarios are probable, but are they plausible? Scenarios are not strategic plans. They're not about the community, but rather about the context in which the community operates. They're mostly about the things we don't know, about the things that are coming at us from the future. They work from the outside in, helping organizations wind tunnel their strategies. They let you ask, how does my organization fare in these scenarios? What threats and opportunities may present themselves? What do we need to do today to prepare? We analyzed the uncertainties that we face, and we selected two key dimensions to structure our scenarios the strength of economic indicators and the level of cohesion and equality in society. We then imagined how these dimensions can evolve in the next two years and created four different scenarios. In one, the economy has recovered and improved. Society has higher cohesion and less inequality. 
the world is experiencing a new version of the Roaring Twenties. We call this scenario a new renaissance. In another, the economy has bounced back, but the recovery has accentuated existing inequalities and created even more fragmentation and social tension. This is a world of gated communities for the rich and riots for the poor. We call this scenario have and have nots. In the third scenario, the economy doesn't recover. We are in a long depression and simultaneously, the society is fragmented, even violent. Inequality rises. The economic crisis fuels extremist movements and society approaches the breaking point. We call this scenario back to the 1930s. In the last scenario, the economy doesn't recover, but the smaller pie is distributed more equitably. The society has learned to exercise solidarity and a new spirit of cohesion has emerged from the pandemic. We are poorer, but seem to be happier. We call this scenario a smaller but tastier pie. After designing the scenarios, we asked what their implications are for different sectors within the Jewish community. What are the challenges and opportunities that each alternative future presents us? For example, how will human service agencies cope with the double whammy of more needs and less funding? How will we do Israel engagement in a world in which travel remains infrequent? How do we benefit from a renaissance in arts and culture? How do we keep the community safe? How do we work with students when in most scenarios there's a decrease of young people going to campus? Will we see more assimilation? Will the hostility of the general society in some scenarios result in a bigger sense of community? Will religion and synagogues grow or diminish in importance in each of the scenarios? And finally, we asked ourselves, how do we prepare to be resilient and thrive in each scenario? What are the steps that we need to take today to confront the future? What new skills will we need? What new organizational architectures? What new coalitions? Each of us would love to see the world evolving toward a preferred scenario but we resisted the temptation of a good or bad judgment on any, as each scenario presents us with challenges, threats, and opportunities. Ultimately, we cannot stop the tsunami of the future, but if we're thinking about the future with creativity and open-mindedness, we can learn how to surf it. Thank you. And now um, we're going to uh, try to understand a little bit more in depth the, the how scenarios work uh, following it on the presentation. I'm going to share my screen. So uh, in the meantime, by the way, if you want to send questions or comments, use the chat function. We're going to try to get to them uh, during, the, during the session or after. So to to continue uh, on the scenarios. What the scenarios aren't is as important uh, as what they are. So they are not strategic plan. A scenario gives you the context for your strategic plan, but it's not your plan. It's not a forecast. It doesn't try to predict what the future will bring. Uh, and it's not good or bad. It, it, the, the, the basic assumption is that any scenario, even those that we consider bad from an ideological perspective, can offer opportunities and, and, and threats. The good scenarios can present threats as well. And you're gonna see that as the process continue. But if this is what they are not, so what they are. The scenarios are in fact stories of the future. They present uh, different alternative futures that we may be facing in a given time frame. They are not based on what we know, but they are based on what we don't know. They identify critical uncertainties, and they imagine what happens if those uncertainties evolve towards different, uh, to a, to a di uh, different parameters. So for example, uh, the economy is an uncertainty. In one scenario, the economy evolves in one direction. In another scenario, the economy evolves in another. There are many such uncertainties. 
And over the process, we peak uncertainties to structure our scenarios around it. In the traditional way of forecasting and planning, you imagine that there is one path from the present to the future. In scenarios, you actually imagine that there are multiple paths leading to multiple futures. Scenarios are not good or are actually a waste of energy if your environment is very stable. Uh, scenarios are good for conditions of TUNA. TUNA stands for turbulence, uncertainty, novelty, ambivalence. And if you look at the world today, uh, we can check on all of them. We are living in very turbulent times and therefore the scenarios that based themselves on what we don't know rather than we do know are very important. This is critical. The scenarios are not about you or not about your organization. It's about what's coming at you from the context. In that uh, sense, it's very important to stress that scenarios, because they're highly contextual, they can only be made for a specific country or a specific area. In this exercise that we did, we centered on the US, but of course, uh, different organizations can do different scenarios for uh, different contexts. As I said, so we start by looking at the general context, the American context in this case, then we look at my immediate context, which is the Jewish community, and only at the end, we look at my own organizations. As I said, we're based on what we don't know rather than what we know. We ask ourselves what is coming towards us, and then when we have the scenarios, when we have different alternative futures, we can ask ourselves the following question. How does my strategy fare in each of the alternative scenarios? This is like putting a plane in a wind tunnel. The plane needs to fly in different weather conditions. Doing this exercise allows you to understand in which conditions, in which scenarios, your strategy becomes obsolete, becomes irrelevant, or even counterproductive. And it also allows you to actually adjust your strategy, as it were, adjust your plane to better survive the different weather conditions. Now, once you created the alternative futures, once you design these four plausible scenarios, you go back and you ask yourself this, what do I need to do today in order to be robust and to survive and thrive even in, the, um, in each of these scenarios? Um, what are the skills that I need? Um, what, are the, what are the assets that I need? What training do I have to give uh, my, my, my people? What coalitions do I need to create today in order to be resilient in each of these, of these scenarios. So in, in sum, these scenarios are a small of manufactured plausible futures. They're not predictions. They're just alternative scenarios that we may face. Um, they are off the economic and social context of the US. Scenarios are always off something for somebody. In our case, the scenarios are of the economical and social context of the US for Jewish communal leaders, funders, and practitioners with the purpose of making sense of the context, inform our planning, stress test our strategy, and expand our thinking in identifying opportunities and be resilient in the, in the future. So, we're going to, I'm going to now give the floor to Dina to explain a little bit how we did this process in the context of JFN, and then we're going to move over to the implications of the scenarios. Hi, everybody. Um, Dina Fuchs, um, Executive Vice President of Jewish Funders Network, and I'm going to share um, with you uh, just a few minutes just to uh, explain how we um, how we develop the scenarios that are part of our package and what we're going to be working with today. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to um, just share two personal observations with you. Um, I had never done, I've never gone through a process like this before. This was my, my first time. And I, I have to tell you, I thought it was, uh, it was really an incredible experience for me. 
Um, and I, I have a few takeaways that you know, I think I, I just like to share with everyone. One, um, to get the best out of the process, you really need to suspend any, any need you might have for clarity or a clear direction. You have to feel okay, uh, let alone comfortable with ambiguity and sometimes contradiction. It's about mindset. Um, and um, you know, in this time of uncertainty, it's, you know, we, we want to be able to hold on to something, but being able to suspend that need is enormously helpful. And I think if you're going to go through this process, if you could just think about that as you go into it, and if you're going to engage with others, I would just say sort of anticipate that need from others as well. Um, the second thing I'd like to share is that I was a little skeptical going into this. I mean, again, you know, talking about uncertainty, there's so much anxiety that comes along with it. And here we are imagining four more futures that we have no idea um, that are coming at us. And, and we don't really know how, what, you know how the chips are going to fall, as the video said. Um, but what I found going through this process, which I actually found comforting, um, and it was a real aha moment for me, is as, the, as you, you work with the scenarios, you start to identify certain um, commonalities, right? Certain um, implications that are the same and things that you can do that are the same and strategies that can be implemented that are actually the same. In any event, there's real, there's real comfort um, uh, in, in actually being, it to, being able to identify things to do, right? Like well, what we, um, Dan Ariely recently spoke on a JFN webinar, I think it was last week, and he said the two things that people need are control and purpose. And I think this process actually gives us a little bit of both. So I would just um, wanted to put that um, out on the table. Um, so let me tell you what we did. We, we pulled together a group of about 15 um, people. Um, they were comprised of JFN staff, JFN board members, um, uh, communal leaders, funders, and foundation professionals. And we worked with a, a, a leading expert in um, scenario planning. And we, um, we spent four one-hour sessions together. As Andres mentioned, this is an incredibly long process that we condensed into something very tight. Um, I can only imagine how much fun it would have been if it was long, but um, it, was, uh, it, it was incredibly intensive and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through the process. We, we broke into two groups. So we were about seven or eight people in a group and we spent most of our time together in our groups. Um, and I am gonna share with you, and I'm just gonna share my screen now, on the actual byproducts of my group. Um, okay, so what we did was we first worked with this um, um, blank template. It'll look familiar to something that Andre showed before, the sort of three circles. Here's the context, right, the U.S. context. Here's the, um, the Jewish community, and then here's your organization or a particular sector in the community. But we were tasked to focus on this outside um, uh, circle. And the, the task we were, we were given was to come up with as many contextual factors that we think um, will have bearing uh, on our world. Um, and my group, we spent a half an hour on this process. And let me just say it was a very generative, productive half hour. And we came up with this um, stickies that the technology was, was, pretty, was pretty helpful too. Um, and I just wanted to read a few of them just to show you the, the span of the thinking we were doing. You know, there's um, here more do it yourself, everything, gender role shifts, um, Israel fading in the background. Um, you know, uh, fading focus on Israel to domestic, less privacy, um, polarization, globalization. So we really covered the gamut. Um, and then we were asked to collapse them and categorize them in a, a few categories. So we have here, or it's hard to see on the slide, I'm sorry, but social factors, um, economic factors, political factors, technological factors, um, environmental and legal. Um, and I'm sharing the slide just to also to show you how you can compress the thinking, but it was also interesting when we got to this point, we realized that there were some voices that were missing at our table in terms of experience. We didn't really have many environmentally focused voices and believe it or not, we didn't have enough lawyers at the table. Um, but it just goes to show you that really the need to, to think about who's at your table in terms of experience and, and, and breadth of knowledge and, and perspective. Um, so then we were asked to take all of these, you know, sort of compressed factors and identify two um, that were the most, I guess, predictive or had potential impact um, and were structurally strong in how, on what we can build our scenarios. And we landed on the economy and social cohesion and equity. Um, 
I'd like to just take a moment here to say, we could have landed on others. That's not to say that these are the only two. Um, it's not to say that the other factors that we were considering were not any, were any less important. Um, I think when we just as a group were working, we felt that these were the most structurally strong to build, um, to build our narratives on. I know that the, um, JFNA has been working on a similar process and they, they um, use the two polls, one of the economy like, like we had done and the other was um, around convening power. Um, we actually contemplated convening um, as well. And if you see when you read our scenarios, they're actually enormously um, important in the narratives as are all the other factors that we didn't take. It doesn't, like I said, it's not that they're not important. They just weren't the, the structures or the, you know, sort of the bones, they, but they became the flesh. Um, so I think that's important just to notice. Um, and the truth is when we look now, you know, we wrote these scenarios back in late April, early May. Um, I think we did a pretty good job in picking our, our polls in light of the way that the world has been unfolding. Um, but again, I think others, others, others would have been um, just as, um, as uh, effective. Um, okay, so then we have our polls and that gives us our quadrants, um, which is you know, what the video explains. We have high social cohesion, high economy, that's the new renaissance. Uh, we have low economy, high social cohesion, a smaller but tastier pie. High economy, low social cohesion, the has and have nots, and low economy and low social cohesion back to the 1930s. Um, and then we went, we got creative, and members of our team started um, writing up narratives for each of those scenarios. Um, and the only thing I'll say here is that while the scenarios are presented and ultimately written in a chronological um, fashion, meaning with a beginning, a middle, and an end, when they're actually conceived and written, we do it backwards. I've heard this um, also been referred to as history of the future, but we imagine what 2023 would look like and then we figure out how we got there and in a backwards fashion and then we write it the other way. Um, and so then we end up with our four scenarios. Um, the next piece, again, as the video explained and, and we're gonna spend the rest of this session on are the implications. So we took, um, we took the liberty of filling in that second circle, right? We had, as a group, we worked on the context and then JFN, we, we built the second, the second um, circle, which was um, the Jewish community context. And we thought about the implications of these scenarios on the Jewish community as a whole. Um, and you'll see what I mean. In each of our scenarios, we've appended um, what we saw as those implications. But the next step is really the critical one, right? And that's what do we, how do we take the scenarios, the implications for the Jewish community, and what kind of bearing do they have on whether they be sectors in the Jewish community, like young adults or summer camps or synagogues and spiritual communities, um, or on a particular organization. Um, and that's how we're gonna spend the rest of our time now. And I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna do that. Um, Andres is gonna uh, uh, first share with you a, um, a process that the JFN staff went through, or we went through ourselves. We, we took the scenario has and have nots and we considered as a group, um, what are the implications of that scenario on Jewish philanthropy? Um, and we built our own um, implication slide, which Andres will share with you and sort of how that unfolded. And then the second thing we're gonna do is Andres is gonna facilitate a fishbowl um, exercise. Um, ideally, when you're learning how to do this, you do it in an interactive way. Thankfully, we have so many people interested in this work. So we're gonna show you what it looks like and hopefully that will give you the experience. Um, we have some fish in the waiting room who are, have agreed to to um, work with Andres on this facilitation and hopefully it'll, I mean, we did this last week and it went really well. I am only, can only imagine it will be great today. Um, and, um, but before we get to those two exercises, um, I've referenced the have and have not scenario that we use both at JFN and we're gonna use in this fishbowl. And I'd like you all to be able to um, familiarize yourself um, with it as well. So I'm actually gonna stop sharing the screen um, right now. Um, because Tamar is going to share in the chat a link to the have and have not scenario. Um, we're gonna use five minutes with everyone just gets a chance to review it. But before you start reading, I just wanted to say two quick things. One, um, we actually we wrote this scenario in the end of April, beginning of May. So I just think that's important to know when you read it. Um, and the second thing is it's difficult to read. Um, I don't wanna project, but I, I think a lot of people would agree it's not, um, it's not so easy. Um, we were debating using it, um, but we felt it was important. Um, and it goes back to one of my opening points is that there is something um, 
therapeutic or comforting about doing this work and being able to take some um, control and sense of purpose in the work we're doing. And this process does allow that to happen, or at least it did for me, and I'm hoping that you will agree um, as you go through with it. Thank you for the patience in, in reading it. If you need a little bit more time, you can continue reading um, as we speak. So what, what we did afterwards with each of the, of the scenarios is the following. We asked, what are the implications for the Jewish community of each of these scenarios, right? And we try to fill a chart like the one you're seeing in the screen now. Now, of course, talking about the Jewish community is too broad. So what we did is we, we narrowed down, the, or, or rather we divided the Jewish community in different communal systems, young adults, camps, human services, arts and culture, synagogues, day schools, etc. We did one also for the field of Jewish philanthropy, how this scenario impact the field of Jewish philanthropy. So you can see that, you know, we did with the Jeff and staff because the sector of philanthropy affect us particularly, we try to identify what are the implications for us. And we came uh, up with many such implications. So for example, one of them is that many funders that now are funding in the field of Jewish identity or Israel engagement will shift to human services. Uh, there will be more wealth accumulation, which can be good for philanthropy, but on the other hand, philanthropies are gonna be squarely in the field of the haves and the tension with the have-nots is gonna be complicated. Uh, there's gonna be much more reliance on philanthropy to solve social problems. Uh, there's going to be more reliance on fewer and bigger funders rather than middle class funders that today constitute the majority of the community GDP. Uh, there's going to be a fragmented and polarized Jewish community and the philanthropic field too. So the exercise was to go and analyze how this is impacting us. But then, of course, you ask what the, what the opportunities are for you in this scenario. Now, in this scenario, for example, there will be a need to collaborate more to solve complex social problems. That could be an opportunity for the, for the Jewish philanthropic sector and for JFN in this case in, in particular. Uh, what are the threats? Uh, people are gonna be more isolated and more inward looking, so there's gonna be less desire for being interested in, in other areas, in other problems of global philanthropy. So for an organization like us, JFN, that is based on global networking, there could be a problem here. Um, foundation professionals may be stressed between being close to the have-nots, but representing the haves or have a lot of issues with that. Then you ask, okay, what do I need to know now? What skills and competencies do I need in order to be uh, resilient in this scenario, right? So how can we how can we be better at our work if the world looks like that scenario? And finally, we ask, what can we do now, right? So if we know that there's going to be tension between grantees and funders, so maybe we need to start working on funder-grantee relationship today. If there's going to be more isolation, maybe we need to explore other tools other than Zoom for collaborating. If we know global networking is going to be problematic. Maybe we need to start working on regional networks. In other words, we go from implications to action plans, but the action plans don't start by what we want to do, rather by what do we need to do in order to respond to this scenario. And of course, then you do this for the sector that you care about in all of the four scenarios. At and as Dina said, you're gonna realize that many of the implications and many of the things that you have to do today are very similar in, for example, three of the different scenarios. So we're gonna now try to do um, a little example of how this process works in, in practice. And we have, as Dina said, three, volunteer, three volunteers, Zoya, uh, Reigns, um, Karin Cohen and Adina Friedman, who are gonna be our uh, guinea pigs here in trying to think uh, on the, of the implications for the specific field of 
young adults. So we're gonna try to do this as if this was a workshop and we would try to fill up this, this chart. So first of all, thank you guys for joining us and start shooting. What do you think are the, the main implications that this scenario is going to present for the field of young adults, which is a field that you guys are working on. So Andres, one of the things that you mentioned in the implications around have or have nots is that perhaps college will continue to be a online experience, partly because of the cost, the cost of uh, in-person university or um, residential university is gonna be quite high. So there's going to be significant um, experiences that will be virtual. And so that with that, I think comes many implications. Um, I'll just name a few. One is the question around failure to launch. You know, um, for many leaving for college, going away is, uh, is a rite of passage and is an opportunity for young adults to come of age, so to speak. So I think that's an interesting, like what is the, the implication of that delay? Um, I'll stop there and I'll open to my colleagues. We can keep going. I think an obvious implication is that um, what we know is an important um, way of connecting uh, and creating community, which is being together in person, is no longer um, going to be a tool that we can use in the same way. So we'll probably, you know, when we get to the some of the columns on the right, uh, we'll probably start to uh, see smaller groups um, coming together as opposed to larger groups. Um, in some ways, I think we could see a narrowing of interest and focus because people are going to be selecting online rather than kind of serendipitously um, engaging with each other um, in different experiences. Um, and um, I think I, I think there's going to be, hopefully, maybe this is wishful thinking, if we don't all move to Canada in this scenario, um, is that- We don't know uh, what the scenario is for Canada, wait. Sorry, <laughs> right, exactly. Assuming that it's better to our north. Um, I think that you could see um, a real mobilization of young adults um, and that- um, You mean the, political mobilization, right? Political, social, I mean, you know, you've got a lot of social service questions um, that are presented in this scenario. Um, and so whether it's political or from a social service perspective, I think you're gonna see um, young adults start to perhaps um, think and create um, their own um, paths in their own communities um, because um, prior paths are no longer relevant or open to them. Along those lines, I do think there's going to be a strong bifurcation to those that are going to follow because they're going to be living with their families longer um, in this multi-generational scenario. Um, I also think there's going to be the bifurcation of people that are going to follow closely along the lines of where their families went. And then there's the, the part that are going to rebel further, um, kind of creating that younger angst, I think, that we've seen society um, move towards. I think the, the fragmentation also, even along the religious spectrum, um, um, where, where that can entail, uh, where people are going to be forced in some kind of like closer communities versus um, those that will have the, the freedom because a lot of this will be more under adult control. Um, so that could create additional complications. Hmm. Building on what Zoya and Karen said, you know, I think the impact of, of young adults being home, I, I think one of the interesting things could be the, the impact on the relationships, the, the closest of the relationships they'll have with siblings and parents, and just the role that they play in the system. You know, I think we, we've, we've, I think for years thought about this gap period when young adults are actually not home and they're, they're largely absent from, in terms of influencing um, the system. And so I just think that that will be really interesting. Uh -huh. um, also, in this scenario, we talk a lot about the, the economic impact. It will be interesting to see how many young adults have to work, particularly in the have-nots, right? So um, taking second jobs, having to do um, college on a much slower, like long, you know, long-term plan, multi-year, in order to support themselves and or their families. Um, 
I think that could be an interesting implication. And Karen, too, you, you mentioned before about the political activity. I think we could see one of two, or, of two extremes, right? We could see that young adults are inspired sort of in a toward the next revolution, or we could see an extreme apathy, right? Just mm -hmm. frustration with the lack of progress, the lack of movement, the lack of change, um, and really feeling somewhat paralyzed um, because things aren't you know, they don't see their impact or their ability to impact things. And along those lines, in terms of the apathy, I think the anti-Semitism that unfortunately usually comes out um, as referenced here, but usually comes out in times like this, um, I think on the religious side could actually uh, empower some people's Judaism, just because unfortunately, as we've even seen um, in the current scenario, not even going as bad as parts of this go, um, that's going to come out. And I think there's not, there's less social Judaism um, in uh, environments like this. And I think you are more your identity of what your religion is. And I think it's gonna force people to really look at it as young adults before they have children, before they have to make those decisions along those lines um, at a younger age. It's a, it's a controversial opportunity, but it's an opportunity nonetheless. Yeah. And, so just and one demographic thing to add there, Andres, which is, um, and I think about young adults up until probably 30 or so, um, you could see a baby boom. Um, you mm. could see um, potentially people who are, um, you know, looking to start their families in a place where it's harder to connect. Um, and I also, um, I think the geographic changes, we, we assume that they're going to end up living with their parents. I don't know. I think there's going to be a mass exodus from cities, but I think they're going to um, find rural, small communities and um, mm. towns that are kind of... Uh, need to be revived and you could see these kind of clusters of young adult communities um, uh, appearing. Yeah, I mean the baby boom can work both ways. It could be also a situation in which people are afraid to start a family because of the financial and economic insecurity. So, I mean, the, this is also an example of what happens in the scenario. So many of the things we don't know, it can impact us in one way or it could be the other way. You just try to need to be at least you open your mind to the possibility that it could be a baby boom, it could be exactly the opposite, but at least you start thinking in those terms. One, one idea that came to my mind well, while, uh, while uh, Adina was talking is that we tend to think of young adults as needing engagement activities, but not in needing social services. Now in this scenario, young adults may well be, and Gen Z may well be recipients of social programs, and we're not even set up for that. Our social programs are set up to serve the elderly, right, or marginal communities. Absolutely, and I, I do think that there could be a significant rise in mental health yes. challenges, right, sort of going along Absolutely. with the incredibly pressured environment and just the level of, of stress and and frankly, lack of optimism. I, I think that that, and we'll, when we get to solutions or potential opportunities, you know, we'll talk about what it looks like to build resiliency. Um, you know, what are the kinds of skills that might be needed? But I, I do think that mental health could be very much on the rise. Right. Let's let's try to move now. And this is, of course, by no means exhaustive. Again, this is just to give you guys a flavor of the mm -hmm. of the process. What what are some opportunities that present themselves in this in this scenario for folks working in the in the young adult space? So I think um, micro hyper local communities will be an interesting phenomenon um, that um, if we can have smaller groups of people coming together that people are going to do that which means you know smaller spaces lots of get smaller gatherings um, is an opportunity and then another one, um, well there are two others, one I mentioned before that's on my mind is whether um, this generation, um, and it's probably two or three generations in this cohort, um, will um, will actually mobilize to meet the needs of the social service needs of others in the community. So with the elderly who are gonna be home, according to this scenario, um, for another year and a half, um, what role can, um, what role could we have young adults play, um, kind of almost like a service core um, to meet some of the social service needs. And then finally, I think there's enormous need in virtual reality. If we can figure out how to do certain things, particularly related to Israel engagement, potentially, maybe not as much for this group, but um, uh, you know, these people are on playing a lot of games, they're gamers. Um, 
there is some potential there as well. So and we, I think we along... just, yeah, sorry, just, just to add here to the implications actually, there is stress on travel-based Israel engagement, right? Because people are traveling less. And that responds, and that actually brings what Karin was talking about, you know, gamifying that and using virtual reality to, to uh, replace that or to compensate for that. So yeah, sorry, I cut you. No, no worries. And I think actually the, but I actually think the opposite of the, the micro hyper local could happen in the sense of um, since everything is virtual, it could actually bring more geographic diversity um, where when you're in Columbus, Ohio and your typical young leadership community is just the Columbus, Ohio Jewish community or the Upper West Side community. Um, I think it actually could create more diversity of thought um, because it's, there's much lower barriers to entry to connect different groups of young adults and, and everyone within the population. But I actually think it could um, give people broader opportunities that are typically limited by economics or other factors. You can also you can also access to much higher quality content when everything is virtual. You can use a top lecturer, and you are not bound to the Hebrew school teacher of your local synagogue. Exactly, and there's more shared content around that too. So even yeah. if a uh, speaker's in demand and you have them once, you can also allow the replay um, so that the content is in as long as relevant perpetuity. Right. Yeah, and I, I will add to that that I think with, um, with college students potentially fewer being on, on site and residence in, in universities, there could be a real proliferation of um, engagement opportunities for college students locally. So we talked about the shift from the sort of the campus to local community in in, the, in towns. So so many more people and organizations stepping into the young adult engagement space, um, which I think could be very interesting. Particularly the relational building things. So if you think about like the work and the critical role that. Um, and I'm sure that Hill will make a huge pivot in this new scenario, you know, to thinking about how to simulate their incredible work around, you know, coffee dates and, and engagement um, locally. And they may also need to look to, you know, some local partners in doing this kind of work. So I think that could be really interesting. And I want to bring back what I said at the beginning about uh, the, the impact of young adults being potentially being home or closer to home. They, you're right, they may or may not live at home. Um, on the system and the opportunities that exist, again, in their having um, some role around whether it's in the, um, you know, psychosocial, emotional uh, of the of siblings, of parents, of grandparents. I just think it could be really, there are opportunities there, I think, in the system and then playing a role um, in, yeah, in lifting up the whole. Yeah, uh, great. So let's, Let's try, to, let's try to look at threats for a minute. I think they're pretty obvious, but let's just name a few just to, to put them out there. Debt from education loans. Sorry? So can you repeat Debt, that? significant debt, carried over debt oh. from education loans. I just think complete, uh, you know, going down, whether it's mental health, um, just disengagement, um, mm -hmm. overall kind of depression of the trajectory. Um, of where things are going. Um, human con relationships, in-person relationships, whether it's, um, um, and the things that come with that, the serendipitous experiences that come with in-person, um, larger, like group, or medium-sized group relationships, so the loss of like, learning something new, experiencing something new, meeting someone that you might not meet um, in, in person. Um, right. And, and um, along, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh no, I was just gonna say along those, exactly along those lines and what that really means to the Jewish social fabric where we're so much about dominions and meeting in person um, and kind of how do we continue down this path in a, in a very altered scenario? And what does that mean to kind of the religion that we can also um, pass along to the young adults in the community overall. Right, right. And I would say that for certain organizations, there's a serious threat in terms of where their assets are based and where are people based. In other words, if you're Hillel, your assets are mainly campus based, but mm -hmm. 
now there's less people going to campus. So that's a threat to your business model in a way. Right. Or if your people are, or if your infrastructure is urban, but people have moved, like Karin was saying, to small rural communities or suburban places. So then your infrastructure is, is mm -hmm. actually inadequate. Yeah, similarly, Andres, I think the entire industry of um, either gap year or uh, college summer oh, travel mm -hmm. service, like anything that involves travel is going to be compromised and that all, all those sectors will have to reimagine, you know, themselves and what they, what those experiences look like, whether it's local or virtual. Yep. Okay. And one of the things that we can do today to get ready for this, like, what are the skills or competencies that we can start developing now and or any other actions that we can take to 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 try to you know use the opportunities protect ourselves from the threats and minimize the implications some of these things are kind of jewish community specific and some are not you know the not is I think we don't know a lot yet about how to connect effectively virtually. Um, and there's a lot more we can do there around how do we use technology um, for all kinds of different experiences. For the Jewish community specifically, um, I think leadership is, um, I think there's a question about dynamic leadership and what leadership online looks like versus leadership offline. Um, and some of that has to do with the technology. I also think we need to be testing things. So organizations, um, you know, are not at the place yet where they should be changing their mission or what they do necessarily. But what does it mean to start testing? If you do trips to Israel, what does it mean to start testing other things now to understand what works? So that, you know, depending on what the scenario is, you may be prepared and you may learn that organization needs to fold because yeah. it can't adapt or you might learn that maybe something else really works. So I think this whole idea of testing um, yeah. and, and flexibility um, as well as the technology, the technology. Yeah, and it goes together with mapping the space, right? Like you're saying some organizations may need to fold, some others not, but we first need to know who's doing what and who can adapt and who can't and how, how different organizations are going to mutate. Yeah, but you don't know that. I don't know that you can map who's going to adapt and who's going to not adapt. Right. Because I think but, but at least you can map where you are now. Yes, then, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Zoya, do you want to say something? Um, so yeah, my number one was also uh, technology. I mean, I, I, obviously technology is not an area that anyone would come as the top five strengths of the Jewish community somehow. Mm -hmm. um, the technology innovation and, and to that last point also partnerships, um, just because I think we're all kind of a little outside of this, of course, zoomed out. Um, so there's so much overlapping content um, and there, there, there's ways that we can kind of be much more uh, efficient, both in delivery of the content and also the creation and kind of bringing different people in and different resources. So I think those are the three things we'd have to emphasize in terms of technology innovation and partnerships um, to really do this optimally versus everyone kind of just try to create like a halfway online version of themselves, yeah. um, but not in the right authentic way that probably speaks to our right. entire community, let alone the young adults who are very technologically advanced. Right. So I think there's some, um, there's some muscles and skills that are going to take a years to build and, and it would be a good idea to start building those now. For example, um, we mentioned before resiliency, um, whether it's tools like positive psychology or other kinds of tools that will help to uh, prepare this particular population, I think for, for what is coming and for what they'll need um, to I think it's going to be really important. Um, also, we didn't talk that much in the implications about the lack of social cohesion, uh, but I do think that in the skills building, that conflict resolution, coalition building, like facilitation, those are going to be very important skills, I think, moving forward if we want to navigate what's coming. Excellent. Yeah. And I would say also uh, explore models of activists of Jewish belonging that also mix social services. I'm thinking of the case of uh, Detroit where, you know, the idea of providing young people with jobs and providing them with Jewish engagement goes 
hand in hand. And this could be a model that we we may need to replicate more and more in this in this new scenario. That was the yeah. That was part of the um, the mobilization for social needs too. We see some organizations in Israel doing that really well with young adults. Right. Okay. So as you see, we can we can continue going on and and creating uh, you know action plans for the future and explore what we could do. And there was a question here: Do you do this for all the four scenarios? Ideally, yes. Uh, although, you know, you can say, this is the scenario that scares me the most. So maybe I got to do this for the scenario that scares me the most if I don't have time to do it for the, the four of them. Or this, but the beauty of when you do it for the four of them is that, as Dina was saying before, you start realizing that there is a, that there is a lot of overlap. Like for, the, for three of the scenarios, for example, there's a decrease in campus attendance, right? So you realize that, it's not so daunting to prepare for all of the scenarios because what you need to do to prepare, in many cases, the same action responds to several uh, scenarios. So this is a, as we said, a flavor of the process. Thank you so much, Zoya, Adina, and Karin for uh, giving, giving us your thoughts and, and your creativity here. Uh, there are a couple of questions from, uh, from the participants that I want to get to. Um, I just want to say two things. First of all, uh, we don't have to cut the Zoom. Like we're going we're gonna to stop it formally in a couple of minutes. But those of you who wants to stay and keep an asking questions and learning more about the, um, the, the process, please uh, stay on and uh, we can continue talking. Uh, Dina. Great, thank you. So I just wanted to do two quick things. Um, and first, but before we do that, thank you. Karen, Zoya, and Adina, that was awesome. I knew, we knew it would be, so thank you. Um, you were editor to, to the thinking and um, it's been, I, I hope for everyone watching, you get to see how strong that tool can be. We are, um, we put up on our website where that link is for the scenario and anything that you've seen in EJP or, and we'll send out the link to the website again. Um, we really think this tool is, um, helpful and important, and we wanted to make it available to the community. The site is available to the community. Any, all of the use of our scenarios and the process by which we went through um, and in the process by coming up with implications is open um, for everyone to use. So please feel free to share and use as you like. If you'd like to go any deeper, um, whether it's in facilitation training or working through scenarios, please reach out to me or to Andres and let's figure out how we can do something together that will um, that will help you get what you need in both, whether it's sector specific or organizationally specific, we are, we're really happy um, to talk it through with you and think about the best ways that these scenarios can be, um, can be leveraged. I gotta address one of the questions here. Um, do you, how do you do this in your shop? Do you start with the four scenarios or do you start with one? The answer to that actually depends on um, on what type of organizations you run. So let's say if you run an organization that is centered on one specific area, say young adults, say you run a Hillel. So you may wanna take the horizontal line of the chart, meaning young adult in the four scenarios, right? Now, if on the other hand, you run a generalist organization like a federation, you may wanna you may want to analyze the impact of the scenarios in all of the different community systems because you work with young adults, you work with older adults, you work with camps, etc. So in that case, it's really heavy to do the four scenarios. So you rather do one, but you do it for all the, all the different sectors. You pick, as I was saying before, you pick the one that scares you the most, you pick the one that you think it's more likely to happen, and you focus on, on that. There's another question here. Um, scenario would be more effective if it's done by a board or a committee that would talk about scenarios and make recommendations to the board. Excellent question. Um, what you need for the scenarios to be good and successful and creative is cognitive diversity. Like, so the, the answer to that is depend, depend how your board is. If your board is all, 
you know, old white males like, like me. So I wouldn't recommend it to do it in, in your board because it, you're going to get scenarios that are not creative enough because we don't have enough cognitive diversity. Um, it also depends how much time you have, frankly, you know, uh, but, but I would definitely do that whether it's in your board or not. The key word is diversity, like you need gender diversity, you need age diversity, uh, geographic. It, if, if it applies, uh, do you have any Jew of color in your scenario plan across the day? Their, their view, their take on their reality is, is very different. I would assume that the have and have nots is interpreted very differently by a person of color than this for a white person in this, in, you know, now and today in the United States. So um, you can do it as you want, as long as you do have a diverse uh, group. Uh, somebody's asking for the full text of the scenarios. They are all online. Um, and so you can just go and look at them there on, online. There is another question here. Um, uh, are you seeing a lot of Jeff and founders struggling to deal with NGOs, their support collapsing or seeing their mission shrink? Uh, yeah, the short answer is of course yes. And scenarios are in a way helpful for funders to, to understand what organizations are going are gonna to survive the stress of the future, right? Um, to a certain extent, scenarios, and I, I hate to put it in such crude and even cruel terms, but scenarios are helpful for folks to understand who gets the ventilator, right? If an organization is is not supposed, is not going to survive in any of the scenarios, so do they get a ventilator? Now, it's a terrible question to ask, but it's a question that we are asking. So we rather ask the same question with more elements than simply saying, you know, whoever I feel worse for, right? So it, 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 the, the scenarios are, if, if nothing else, a tool for having difficult strategic conversations. Okay, thank you all very much. And um, as Dina said, whoever wants to explore this more, just uh, write to us and we'll do what we can to help. Thank you and stay safe, everybody.